Well, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Pierre Soris, and I'm a lecturer on the MA in Contemporary Art at uh, Sotheby's Institute of Art. Um, this event is part of the uh, Artist Talk series that uh, are organized by SOAS and Sotheby's Institute. The idea is to, to invite artists of, at different stages of their careers, artists from different parts of the world, to, to talk about their, uh, their work. So that can be um, artists who want to talk about uh, their practice in general. Uh, we also had in the past artists who focused on a particular period of their uh, art. And uh, we even had talks about one single work. Um, over the past years, we had the pleasure to uh, have um, artists such as Lydia Urhaman from uh, Algeria, uh, Egwe Young from uh, South Korea, uh, William Kentridge also came here to, um, from, South, uh, from South Africa, and recently, just last month, uh, um, Hassan Moussa from uh, Sudan came and uh, talked to us. Uh, tonight, uh, we are absolutely delighted uh, to welcome uh, Zarina uh, Bimji uh, here, uh, who is here with us. And I will ask uh, Shane McCoslan, who is Percival uh, David Professor of the History of Art, to introduce uh, Zarina. Thank you very much, Pierre, and uh, good evening. Uh, from uh, me, Shane, uh, uh, in my role as the head of School of Arts at SOAS. So tonight's talk uh, by Zarina Bimji uh, is going to be my pleasure to be the moderator for tonight's proceedings and to introduce Zarina in a moment. So the format of the evening uh, is essentially that uh, Zarina will give a talk uh, to some slides talking about what well, we'll, we'll see in a moment. Then there will be a, a period where she and I will be in conversation on the stage and then there will be opportunities to open it up and field questions from the audience. Uh, let me just say that uh, if you don't feel uh, comfortable uh, piping up and asking a question in the audience, feel free to jot it on a piece of paper and just hand it to me on the stage and I will happily uh, open up those questions as well. So after the, the, the session here, there will be a reception uh, outside as well where there'll be, uh, if, if we're, you're, you'll be thirsty by then, I'm sure, and there'll be some wine and things and a chance to mingle and to meet the speaker. So. Uh, as I'm sure we all are, I'm absolutely thrilled to have uh, Zarina Bimji speaking here tonight about her current, well, primarily, we think, about her current show at Tate Britain, Lead White, a uh, wonderful show that I recommend you all see if you haven't um, already, which consists of some very, very large, very high quality digital photography, uh, mainly taken in uh, colonial archives around the, around the world, but also of needlework pieces a map and a page from archives. The show runs until June, and I'm absolutely thrilled, actually, that uh, Zarina's first artist talk on the exhibition is here at SOAS. We got in there before Tate. Isn't that wonderful? She knows uh, Bloomsbury. She knows SOAS very well. Uh, in fact, uh, she uh, even recorded mosquitoes next door at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine uh, for her film Out of Blue in 22. So she's, I think, familiar with the world around here. Lead white. So the name comes from uh, a, an old color, which implies beauty, uh, but also toxicity to me. And I, I found it very interesting. It's, it's, it also speaks to the manner in which she takes seemingly very ordinary things, everyday things, and allows them to become ideas and feelings and to have some kind of uh, psychological effect or sentiment or, or values. And the show uh, explores, as I think she will uh, explain in a minute, but at least for me, if you fall for the idea that photography is transparent, then you're taken straight away into the pages of archives. It really kind of makes sense that this, uh, this uh, topic is uh, uh, going to be explored here at SOAS because something underlying uh, Zarina's work is this colonial network, or even a post-colonial network, you could say, 
linking the United Kingdom with South Asia because of her f where there's a, she has family heritage in Gujarat with East Africa because she was born in Mbarara in Uganda in the 1960s. Um, she actually fled to the UK with her family in 1974, but didn't actually return to uh, Uganda until 1998, by which time she had in fact trained as an artist, uh, first at Leicester Polytechnic, then at Goldsmiths in the early 1980s, and finally uh, at the Slade in the late 1980s. But she returned to uh, Uganda and East Africa, and she subsequently worked there and conducted detective work, as she's called it, in archives in London and Edinburgh and Zanzibar and elsewhere, exploring the creation and the polity of the land of her birth in films like Out of Blue from 2002, which I just mentioned, which was partly inspired by Arabic ghazals and Urdu lyrics of the Sufi singer Abida Parveen, uh, films like Waiting in two th from 2009, films like Jangbar, from 2015, Jangbar being the Gujarati name for Zanzibar, meaning the coast of the blacks, to which she'll speak uh, shortly. So she might not really like my introducing her this way through a post-colonial context because she's actually been exhibited and collected all over the world and critically celebrated, not least uh, it being nominated for the Turner Prize in 2007 so I think rightly she sees herself not as an Indian artist or an African artist, but as an artist. And as an artist, she is a filmmaker, firstly a photographer, then I think a filmmaker, installation artist, writer, poet, and most recently a, an embroiderer or tapestry maker. Anyway, I'm absolutely thrilled that she's come to speak to her, to speak to us about her work and, and practice. Uh, things she has called uh, the implied sound or strange links between history, memory, and fantasy. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Serena Bimji. Hi, good evening. Um, Thank you for coming, and thank you, Shane. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to um, talk about five works, uh, but I'll start with the current piece that's being shown at the Tate. And uh, please excuse me whilst I try and work. Oh, yes, great. I hope you can see the images. Could we have it a bit darker, please? Uh, thank you. So um, this is the installation, um, maybe a little bit of light here. Um, uh, it's actually okay for the screen, but just maybe light here. It's better if it's darker, but little light for me. So, uh, okay, so um, this, this is uh, lead white. So there's three pieces being shown at the Tate. Uh, it's part of the Spotlight series. It's on at Tate Britain. And there is two textile pieces. Uh, the title for that is Black, uh, sorry, uh, fifth, uh, I can't, I have to put my glasses on. Um, I have forgotten the title here, and I think I've written it wrong. It's um, something black and then half white. Those are the two textile pieces. So um, I wanted to remember this moment, uh, this moment of the documents. It is important that this work is sensory experience a justification might be offered about the work, it's not useful. I have been thinking about this work for a while. On holiday, I read Beyond a Boundary by C.L.R. James. And that uh, book was, in a way, uh, really important in 
kind of getting the feeling for for the work. So basically, um, I was really drawn to his, in the book, his passion for literature. So how do I start this work? The idea of touch, physical act of Mark making with the camera. At the start, it was important to make this language. I spent ages looking in the camera to make sense. What was it? Why this? I worked very slowly. It, it took me ages to make this work. Gradually, it developed. Color is really important in my work. Um, it's the first time I've worked digitally, and also the fact that it was in the archive, I had to make this work publicly. The light has always been important in my work. This, 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 this work has to be physical. Even the editing was decided by mood and feeling. I selected photographs slowly. It was the first time I worked with the printer as well because the printer relationship is really important in the way that um, they can translate the work in the way that you want it. Um, I didn't want to focus on a particular agenda, but look at the photographs. It was really important, the surface of photographs, scale, tone, how deep the marks were into the paper. So I just... Um, Um, and when, well, whilst I was selecting these images, I kept thinking about sound. I have always been interested in sound score, so I could hear in the images sound, uh, the type of text, spatially, and how big to print. All this was... Um, allows me to focus on photography. Um, I assume I know about race or colonialism, but what I find difficult is about this is the way it's talked about. Um, same language, same sort of associations are used, but what about uh, an, another private understanding of this work as well. The titles are important. They make additional marks. It's not about the explanation, but part of the gestures. Whole work, the whole work, but the whole work. And I'm an artist. I use a video, a visual medium. Uh, if I could write about it or talk about it, that's what I would do. But actually the work physically happens and it's that intensity of from the beginning till the end is really important. Like in this image, the way it was photographed, the gestures, the composition, all that become, they, they somehow you, you look at it and you know that the image is working. In terms of themes, in, I was interested in power, vulnerability, erasure. I work with light, which I hope expresses this mood and feeling. The composition also helps this too. I'm interested in the weight of the image. How are the gesture and space communicated? The tone, the light, composition, even the choice of film, choice of paper, um, all those things, those decisions help this work to give a kind of delicateness that I wanted. That's why I chose not to frame this work. The way the light falls 
on colour is endless and I try to get to this. Mark making is a thinking and a practice in one. It's hard to put it in words, thinking through my eyes and body and again referring to the themes that were in this work were self-hate, not my self-hate but in, in, in actually in the words um, Segregation, menace, fast, slow, text, size, tone, colour, gentle. I approach this intuitively, thinking it my way of seeing and think, thinking it is different. Uh, yeah. Um, and then again, what I wanted to do was talk about installation, how I put it together, which, which was um, quite a challenge because um, I'd taken the photographs and when I made this work, I'd actually worked um, in film before and it's a, working as a film installation artist is very different so I approached, and I hadn't made photographs uh, for about 10, 12 years, so I'd forgotten how to make photographs. And so I took the photographs, then I worked out the sizes for this work. And then to hang it, I hadn't known till the very end. I wanted a narrative that was not linear. I wanted to hang it in groups. It has to work across, across, and some images were an anchor and scale, and there is also a red that runs through throughout the images. So I'll just go through these slides. The kind of, the text, textual quality um, you can see and also, Hope you can. Can you hear me? Um, the way I also manipulated digitally, took out words, um, we changed colours, um, added like at the bottom. You can't see, but the kind of uh, edging. So these are detailed shots, some of you who have not seen the installation. So the stamps were on one side and then text was on the other side of the wall. I find this one really funny because you can you know, the Queen's Court, Victoria Road, um, how in many ways light and subtle these, I, I found this really amusing. I could have gone more this way with the work um, and the one before to kind of keep it more visual, but I actually chose to give it some kind of context. Um, and some words uh, in here I'd taken out so that the puncturing came through more abruptly with the words um, to get get to close to, to get to the to the bone of it so um, after I made the work I was very I was going to put these images because I wanted a different kind of full stop uh, and in the end it got changed and I put some embroidery in it these are cars that were photographed in Zanzibar and for me they were 
I, I shot these on film, and they were, uh, for me, they represent Zanzibar revolution or some kind of revolution. And we worked on this image a lot, and we, I wanted it to look like a fashion shot. Um, And I wanted everyday objects to express vulnerability against those texts, the feeling of everyday life. Um, and I wanted to put the sea image, which I've shot this image about uh, 15 years ago, and I haven't known how to uh, have it in, in, the, in the piece. But I realized that by different way of printing it, and making it gloomy like this, it would work better. So in the end, decided to um, put a map of Africa. Uh, I was in the archives and I actually burst into tears uh, reading these books where um, how Africa was carved up in Europe. And so it took me a while to find the right map because I wanted it to be beautiful as well. Um, I wanted also that I wanted it to feel like linen fabric that you would have in bed that you would be lying. So that was the kind of relationship I think I was trying to create was um, something that you were in bed, vulnerable, but harsh words coming through. So when you look at the detail, it's hand embroidered, really beautiful. So this, this I wanted to show this of three dresses um, I made uh, before I made a set of photographs in Uganda uh, in in 19 uh, uh, sorry I have to look 1998 um, I'd given up all my teaching and I'd been given a Paul Hamlin award um, these are sketches of three maps made or, of uh, India, Africa, uh, and Britain. So I have a long interest in maps, but I've never found a way of uh, making sense of it. Um, and then in my first trip to uh, uh, Uganda, I made three photographs. This one is called um, Grenade, uh, and the size is 127 times 160 centimeters. It's in the form of light box. And this one is memories were trapped inside the asphalt. When I took this image, I realized that certain things couldn't be made as a photograph and that I had to actually make a film and this, this work taught me a lot about filmmaking because I was thinking about the shoes and evidence and what type of evidence do we, do we find if we put the shoes under the magnifying glass. This one is um, howling like dogs, I swallowed solid air, and it's in the collection of the government art collection. It's, these are light box, early works for light boxes. This is illegal sleep. So when I went to Uganda, I was exploring, this is, um, when I make films, I always make large format photographs. So in a way, a rich, in the beginning, they're like sketches, a way of making sense what film might be. Um, 
but then later they become photographs. So this one is called a legal sleep. And one of the things that I was exploring was this idea of large scale betrayal, a human activity that is interrupted, atmosphere of subdu subdued sadness and tenderness. This one is called Bapa closed his heart, it was over. It's actually at the Intebe, the old Intebe airport in Kampala. And the way the photographs are presented is really important to me. Um, when, I mean, not as much now, but when I was making this work, um, you saw starving images of African people and they were really frightening images to look at. But my feeling about Africa was not like that. And so I wanted these images to be really uh, um, beautiful uh, and composed and almost painterly. Um, so these are in various museums that uh, this was in uh, uh, I forget the museum, sorry, but they're in various museums shown. Um, so they have a lot of silence and quietness and space around it. Um, and when, when I, what I call, I do reckeys before I make my films. So like I made 40 works and I visited prisons, uh, housing, in fact, um, the housing was inspired uh, by uh, when I was researching for this film at the SOAS library, which I will explain in a minute. Um, um, I'm just going to show a clip of my first film that I made, which is called Out of Blue. It's a single screen installation, 20, six minutes long. I'm not going to show you 26 minutes tonight, one minute clip. Um, and it's in the collection of uh, Tate, Wordsworth, Athiem in USA, Moderna Museet, Stockholm, Artist Institute of uh, Chicago. Um, it was really important to me that these works went into museum collection because of the history of uh, Idi Amin, various things like that. I, when I was doing research, I realized that there wasn't much creative work at the time done apart from Mahmoud Mamdani writing poetry, which is here at the SOAS library, uh, his early uh, remembrance uh, of coming and living in camps. And uh, there's also another book that was really uh, inspirational. Um, uh, I looked at newspaper cuttings from 1972 to 74, and that's how I plotted the film. Uh, but one thing that I found here in Sawas Library was a PhD student who had uh, written about ginger and how the city was planned, and it was looking at uh, classes of homes by former European homes, high-class residential zones, and he describes Indian homes which have mixture of commercial and residential and how they carry uh, Indian accent on it. And it's really true, like when I went to Jinja, I noticed very typical Gujarati things, and that inspired me to um, uh, the, the tone of the film and the pace of the film. Um, so I'm just going to hopefully uh, put this clip on. I don't know how do I, oh yes, I think it's, no. I think I need help with this, how to put it on the film. Oh yeah, here it is, I found it. Thank you.
more light. Um, I think that's yeah, good. Um, so that, yeah, when I made this film, there was no script. Um, it, um, the sound is equal to the image, and I wanted, like, you know when you re hear a radio, it's, you feel part of that world, and I wanted the sound to feel like that. So you have to imagine what the dust feels like, the texture, um, and the physicality. So the way the work is installed, you physically have to inhabit the space. Um, I really like uh, film material. You can translate it the way you want it. Um, and um, you can take, uh, you know, like, I wanted to look at historical events, but I wanted to approach it metaphorically rather than factually. But the way I did it was by focusing the detail, the smell, the touch, understanding this informed me how to shoot the image and layer the sound. I also did research in British Library here at SOAS where I looked at um, illiteracy. The, the yearning for filmmaking came when I was watching loads of Iranian cinema and one particular film where this gentleman in the middle of nowhere in big mountains walks with blackboards and is teaching people to read and I found that really touching. Um, and also the other thing I did was read uh, um, like this woman had come from Uganda and she was married, but she didn't have any documents, so she couldn't claim for benefits. She didn't have a marriage certificate, so she couldn't prove that she was married. Uh, she was illiterate. Um, so. I got interested in this idea of power of documents, um, you know, in a way, the earlier work that I showed you, the current work that's being shown at the Tate, again, that is to do with power of uh, documents. I also looked at, uh, as I said earlier, uh, international press at how the Ugandan um, Idi Amin asking the Indians to leave, how it was written about um, from the Observer to uh, LA Times. So I looked at all the newspapers because I really, I get a bit obsessed about these things because I wanted to make sense of, uh, I even went to, um, uh, I forget now this where they, tell you about torture and human rights organization. I forget the name of it. And what I was interested in was details of light and texture. But underneath that, I wanted to embed erasure, extermination, and elimination, how this is done in history, um, how time gets forgotten. Um, do I have time to show one more, or have I gone over? This is how the installation is. Uh, I've got some installation shots and close-up of uh, some of the images, some of the, in out of blue, some of the images. Um, when I was talking about the PhD, uh, uh, the housing PhD uh, student thesis that I read, um, it, Go down a bit, yeah, thank you. Because uh, people can't see the images, yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, you can close it, I think I might be able to, you can switch it off completely, be fine, yeah. Sorry, I want you to see the images. <laughs> um, when I was talking about the PhD student that I'd read the housing dissertation, what I found I was interested in was a house being like skin and a place for uh, the walls being um, 
like skin and a protection layer for intimacy. That's what I was trying to partly express as well. So the angles we used and the way the lenses we used, uh, I asked the cameraman to film it in this way, in this little bit of light, um, giving a feeling. Am I going backwards? I'm sorry. Sorry. I, my memory is bad. <laughs> These were the cells. So I'm just quickly going to show you just images of my next film that I made for, uh, it was in a size or factory um, when I was nominated for a Turner Prize. That was about eight, this is, it was called waiting. And this was uh, a film that was shot in uh, Kenya uh, called Jangba. It was commissioned by Nottingham Art Exchange. Um, these are just quick images uh, I shot in India when I was making um, Yellow Patch. These are like background research. I've not, this one, I've never printed it. Um, so I'm going to show last piece of work, which is uh, called She'd Love to Breathe Pure Silence. It is my early work that I did in 1986 and one of the things that I've discovered is um, I have a real difficulty with photography and having it framed on the wall um, and when I was making this work that's when it came up um, this, just to give you a bit of um, background to this work, was um, when Indian women were arriving at Heathrow Airport in the 70s, they were forced to undergo virginity test at the request of Home Office officials in order to determine if they were virgins. One woman challenged, and then these tests were found to be illegal. So this was this is how I, w I was inspired by this and going to Heathrow Airport. Um, but also the uh, way the text is written, I'm really interested in the size of the font, the typeface. Um, it's treated equally like the way I feel about sound or um, it's, it's, it's a part of visual form for me. Um, and so here, I, can everybody read this? Do I need to read it? Would anybody, hands up if you want me to read it? Yes, oh, okay, great. Um, slowly she raised her arm, thin, dark brown, in sun haze, circled by two heavy gold bangles. This had come from home. Every smiley girl wore from birth. And I'm sure some of you will recognize these are uh, anklets. Uh, an uh, and this, this work is in the collection of Victor and Albert Museum. And um, this bird was found in our garden. So I quickly took a picture of it. And it's hand tinted, um, uh, black and white photograph, but hand tinted. The anger turned inward where could I go except to make pain? It flowed into me with her milk. It was mothers and others as they were alike, those watchful, wrathful women whose eyes seared, laid bare those tongues that lashed the world in unremitting distrust. And then you see the passport stamp and behind it, uh, so basically suspended from the ceiling, this work, 
and underneath is turmeric and chili powder. Uh, and where you saw the passport sign is the uh, gloves, surgical gloves that took eg that uh, during the examination metaphorically. So I, I like this work because it's um, about performance. The work becomes alive when you put turmeric and chili powder, but also in weddings, a woman, Indian woman, I, I was going to say woman and assume a woman's because, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, when you get married, turmeric is put on your body. Uh, uh, and also I like the chili uh, in the 70s when there was a lot of packy bashing going on uh, in Leicester. Um, some of us thought that using chili powder was a form of defense. Um, like during Navratri, National Front would break in to a hall. And so as we grew older, compared to our parents, we decided to take the law into our own hands and protect ourselves. So chili was something for me uh, as a metaphor, but also I like the fact that it's domestic object that becomes public. Um, I will end with one more note um, to say that I photograph things that I can't film and I film things that I can't photograph. And I think that's it. I'm going to stop. I think there's uh, maybe, yeah, just that's it. Thank you. Thank you.